sitting here in Amstelveen uh, in the Shiva Yoga Center um, with James Schwartz. Uh, you're visiting uh, our uh, cold country. It's a little cold here. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you come here... Uh, I come from much colder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, have a, we have a home in Oregon in the mountains. And uh, when I left, there were about three feet of snow. Oh, so this is peanuts for so you. So this is peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're visiting Holland uh, uh, for quite some time. Yeah, I've been coming here for, I, for a long time. Yeah. In fact, the first time I came to Holland was in the uh, 60s. In the 60s? I was, right? yeah, I was, a, I was a hippie. You came for, to I smoke weed? I went to Paradiso. Ah, with Willem de Ridder. And... Uh, and and listen to rock music and and take acid and smoke dope. <laughs> Great, that's a good country. <laughs> and I become, so I've been coming here for well, forty five, fifty years. Yeah. Okay. And when you came first, did you uh, immediately start talk uh, start started talking about Vedanta? No, when I first came. But uh, I've been been teaching classes here at the City Yoga, teaching Vedanta here for. I don't know, four or five years now. Yeah. Because I became quite famous because of this uh, book I wrote. The Essence of uh, Enlightenment? Well, the first one is called the, uh, How to Attain Enlightenment. The second one, Essence of Enlightenment, is um, basically the same book, but uh, a little more um, easier to read for Europeans, for yeah. people for whom... English is a second language. Yeah. And uh, I uh, enhanced some of the teachings and added some teachings that weren't there in the first book. So, James, how come we're all in search of this big thing called enlightenment? Well, it depends on what you mean by enlightenment. What, what does enlightenment mean? Well, I, I, if I look to myself, an, an escape. To what? Okay, you want to escape from suffering but where do you where are you going to go where are you going to escape to uh the place where uh, where where the drama of the world no longer is of importance that's good but where is that where is that well i can say that i read in all the books it's inside me it's not in the outside yeah uh, okay and yeah this is the um Okay, it's inside you. Uh, inside where? <laughs> you means what? Inside your body? Well, no. No, it's not inside your body. Inside you means where? Inside my being. And what is your being? Um, this is the point. This is what Vedanta is about. It's what is your being? Vedanta means the knowledge that ends the 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 attempt to escape from this world uh -huh. you are, will no longer try to escape from this world when you gain the knowledge of what your being is because well because the, the your being is complete and whole and full its nature is love or bliss and there and it's and and you're free when you uh, understand who you are so you get uh, there's a huge benefit to understanding what your being is because your being's always free it's always full and complete if if you're if you're full and complete we're going to call it your being now mm -hmm. but your being is a difficult formulation isn't it because it sounds like you and your being are two different things yeah. right yeah huh well, if Vedanta says that reality is non-dual, so you and your being can't be two different things. Mm -hmm. so, so if you are whole and complete, then why is the world a problem? Huh? Yeah. The world's only a problem for me because for me if I, if I think I'm incomplete, because then I want worldly objects, to complete myself. Mm. But the problem with worldly objects is what? Yes, you get temporarily satisfied when you get what you want, but huh, 
you don't remove your basic sense of existential incompleteness. Yeah, it just gives a little uh, satisfaction. It gives you a temporary yeah. satisfaction. Yeah. You and forget then, about the incompleteness. Yeah, you forget about the incompleteness for a few moments, yeah. maybe a day, a week, or a month, it depends. And then what? It immediately returns. And now what? I need another object to complete myself. Yeah, yeah you can come look at the self-storage box uh, I, <laughs> I completed with all the stuff I gained in all the years. It's sitting there in boxes, I walk around, I think, what was I doing? I was looking for... Completeness in, in the object. Yeah, in the object. Gaining. Yeah. And and so, you know, Vedanta it makes it very clear, and it's not that Vedanta is a philosophy. Vedanta is not a philosophy. Vedanta is just an analysis of experience. But it, it, uh, we just look at the nature of human experience and we draw and we extract the knowledge from experience. Mm -hmm. We're not looking for experience for experience's sake. We're not looking, we're looking because experience is just a decaying time capsule that's meant to deliver knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we're knowledge seekers. Vedanta means, Veda Anta means the knowledge that ends the quest for knowledge. So this is a knowledge when you get it, you can't stop seeking to understand anything because you understand everything. And that understanding of everything is understanding who you are, what your being is. And, um, and this is not something you can do on your own. You need a teacher. Yeah, you, you, not only just a teacher. Now that's what the teachers out there, the Advaita teachers tell you need a teacher. But a teacher... Uh, what good is a teacher without a teaching? <laughs> and a, and, and a, a person's experience doesn't count, count for a teaching. Because what I'm experiencing doesn't transfer to you. Yeah. What knowledge transfers, I can give you knowledge if I have knowledge. Like if you, if you don't know that it's cold outside, I, I can tell you that it's cold outside and you can understand what that is. And then you got knowledge. Well, it's cold outside. Right? So knowledge is, you can pass knowledge from one to another, but you can't pass experience from one person to another because your experience is generated from your, your past. Mm -hmm. So these teachers, these, this modern Advaita, Advaita or the Advaita, they call it, they don't even pronounce it properly. The actual pronunciation is Advaita. Dwaita means duality and Advaita means non-duality. They don't have any teaching. They, they've got an idea, they, they, they talk about, they've taken a few teachings from Vedanta. Mm -hmm. One is that you're not your mind and you're not your ego. Now that's an important, that's an important bit of information to have. Because most people think I'm my mind, I'm mm -hmm. my ego, I'm what I think and I'm what I feel. So they tell you you're not that. And they also tell you the positive side, you are awareness. You are limitless awareness. Mm -hmm. So those two bits they've got. But then, then how, but they don't tell you how you get from what? From thinking that you're a limited, inadequate, incomplete body-mind entity to what? To limbless awareness. They have no way of showing you how to go from this point to that point. Most say it's bliss. They say it's bliss. Or, or it's grace when you... When you that's yeah. right. It, in other words, their idea is that something is going to happen that's going to uh, make that connection between you and yourself. That's called yoga, mm -hmm. or the we call that the experiential view of enlightenment. That the the you are by nature incomplete and inadequate, and you will become whole and complete and adequate and free when this thing happens to you. Grace, bliss, yeah. whatever you want to call yeah. it. Huh? You, the, and maybe the guru can transmit it <laughs> magically from his third eye. Yeah. And, uh, there's a lot of people that believe this sort yeah. of thing. But, but Vedanta says uh, wrong. 
Absolutely wrong. Why is that wrong? Totally, completely, absolutely wrong. Why? Because reality is non-dual. Now, what does that mean? That means that there is no separation between the subject and the object, the object being this experience of bliss that you're looking for, mm -hmm. and the person who's looking for it. That's what non-dual means. Mm -hmm. Their whole idea is based upon the idea that duality is a reality, and that you can erase duality by a particular kind of experience. And then you find non-duality. And then you'll discover non-duality. But Vedanta says that reality is non-dual and you're non-separate from reality, so you're already what you're looking for. Now, that idea doesn't sell. Why doesn't it sell? Because it completely contradicts my experience of life. My, you know, my experience of life is that you're there and I'm here. Mm -hmm. And Vedanta says, you're not there, and I'm not here. You're me, and I'm you. That's what Vedanta says. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me, sir. <laughs> huh? Excuse me. That's not how I feel. I'm experiencing it differently. Yeah. Huh? Could you say that, that because people are conditioned this way, and so uh, this is so... Um, how you call it, uh, stiff, you can't get rid of it, you think mm -hmm. that those kind of teachers stand up. Absolutely. They fulfill uh, what, what, it, what people want. Absolutely. They're complete dualists. They're talking non-duality, but they're complete dualists. And the reason they're dualists is because duality, the notion, is hard, we call it hardwired. Yeah. It is, everybody thinks that way. You're taught that way. Yeah. And, and you know, and you can understand. It's understandable. We're not saying that they're bad people or mm -hmm. anything like that, or there's something wrong with them. We're just saying what they have. This duality is based upon the notion that my consciousness, my being, myself is my body. Yeah. Now, if that, if if myself is the, if I am the body, mm -hmm. which most people think. If I touch you, you'll say, well, don't touch me, or please touch me again, yeah. depending on how you feel. Huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, right? Or don't. Or one mm -hmm. um, what do I believe? I believe that I'm the body. Because I said me when, I um, when yeah. my body was touched. So, and if, if I am the body, then you're there and I'm here. Right? There's no problem with that. But what people fail to think about, and, and it's perfectly sensible and it's perfectly logical, and there are moments when, when the, where the, they actually say, this is my body. Now, if this is my body, then I've got to be something other than my body, don't I? Hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. Now, whoever it is that, that what you call my being, your being, is something other than, what, than your body. Mm -hmm. So if I look at you from the point of view of my being, I can't find any difference. If I look at you from the point of view of my body, definitely you're different. Yeah. So this whole idea of grace and this experiential notion of enlightenment is based upon the idea that reality is a duality. That my being or myself or the truth or freedom or God or whatever you want to call it is something other than me. Hmm. Yeah, it has to be found. It has to be found. Yeah. And, and there's no space between you and yourself. There, it's a journey without a distance. There's no space. Yeah. Because reality is flat. It's non-dual. Flat is not the right word, but you don't get what I mean. Mm -hmm. There's no actual separation. Yeah. If reality, if there's any separation between me and anything else, then I can have a journey, then I can do actions and so forth and so on. Yeah. 
But if there isn't, then there's nothing I can do about it. Except what? Understand what non-duality is. And this is what where Vedanta comes in. Now, you say, well, that's all intellectual, James. That's all very intellectual. You see, the, I'm going to tell you that the problem is your mind. You're just thinking. You, this is all intellectual. That's No, we're talking knowledge. It's not intellectual. Knowledge is not intellectual. Knowledge requires an intellect. But knowledge is not intellectual. What is knowledge then? Knowledge is what's always true, or what you can never dismiss. It has no opposite. It has no opposite. It, there's no way you can remove it. Like, f fire is always hot, mm -hmm. right? Sugar is always sweet. There is never... T so that's knowledge. Yeah. Huh? Non-disputable. Non uh, that's right. It's indisputable. Yeah. Now, it, Vedanta says it is indisputable that you're free. It is indisputable that you're whole. It is indisputable that you're complete. It is indisputable that you are, your nature is love. That's that's indisputable. But okay, then what? Then why it, why will no one accept this fact? We say that's a fact. You cannot. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. We say that's knowledge. Then then why doesn't anybody accept it when I tell them? I think they know better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because they believe that, huh, that they need to have an experience to prove it to uh, them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Show me. Show me. We show you, but huh, and you will get an experience that confirms it, but the experience will be the result of the knowledge. Mm. They don't care about the knowledge, they only want the damn experience. Yeah. Fast, fast. Uh, the fast and yeah, easy way. Yeah, yeah. So they get the experience that if they feel so good when they get this experience of non duality, that what do they do? They don't understand the knowledge that's contained in that experience. So when the experience ends, what do they do? They have to go get the experience back yeah. again to feel whole and complete and non dual again. Yeah. That's why we have this thing uh, called satsang hoppers, people who visit. Yeah all the retreats, the satsangs, to fill up or to... Absolutely. Yeah. And and we get, Vedanta gets, the satsang hoppers when they're no longer <laughs> going to hop anymore. Yeah, they're not they, in... they stopped hopping. <laughs> the non-hoppers. The non-hoppers. <laughs> they realize, they've hopped, yeah. but they realize you can't hop there. Yeah. So James, here I am. I, I stopped hopping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good for you. Yeah, I th that's the first stage. Yeah. If you haven't stopped hopping, we can't help you. And we say, go ahead, keep hopping. Mm -hmm. Just keep right on hopping because one day you'll stop hopping because hopping doesn't work. Chasing objects, doing things doesn't yeah. work. And a mature person, a grown-up person, understands that. So Vedanta is for people who've had some life experience, who've analyzed their life experience. And have figured out chasing objects, including enlightenment, experiential enlightenment, doesn't work. And then somehow, if they've got good karma, if they've got good luck, their grace is what? They hear about Vedanta. And, then they, and they're ready to what? Convert their desire to experience something into a desire to understand who they are. So I'm done hopping. I come and visit you. Yeah. What what should should be the first question I ask you? Uh, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now I can tell you who you are, but then you say, okay, so what? I still feel in, inadequate and incomplete. Hmm? I can tell you, you're whole, you're complete, you're non-dual, actionless, ordinary, unconcerned, ever-present, unborn awareness. Awareness, consciousness, existence. Okay, I can tell you that. Sounds great. 
Huh? Sounds great. Yeah. Whole and complete, ever present, unborn, non dual, ever free, existence, consciousness, bliss. Okay, I can tell you that. That's, that's who you are. But I should not start believing this. No, you don't know. You shouldn't start believing it. No, if you believe it, then what? Yes. Yeah, well, you should believe it. Uh, you should believe it pending the results of your investigation. If you don't understand it immediately, if, you, if you're prepared to understand it, then you'll understand it immediately and just that knowledge will set you free. But most of us are not prepared to understand it. So to understand it, I have to believe that that's true. And then what do I have to do? I have to like practice inquiry until I can understand the, the, until I see that it's true. Yeah. And then the, 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 the belief turns into knowledge. Hmm. So we call this faith or shraddha, mm -hmm. it's, but it's a peculiar kind of faith. It's not blind faith. In religion or in the Neo-Dwaita world, Neo-Dwaita is just like a religion. They think they're all spiritual and superior, but they're actually just like religious people because they believe that they're awareness, but what? They have no way to convert that, not, that belief into knowledge. Mm -hmm. They have to keep relying on experiences to prove it to them. Yeah. Keep reading the books. Keep reading the books, keep going to the satsang, yeah. all that sort of thing. So, so, the, so, first of all, it, I, I have to analyze, well, why doesn't this statement make sense to me that I'm whole, complete, unborn, limitless, non-dual, unconcerned, ever-present, existence, mm -hmm. consciousness, bliss? Okay, why, do, why don't I understand that? That's the point. And the first thing that comes to mind to me is because I've been told otherwise all my life. My mind is not prepared to receive it. Yeah. It's resisting. It's resisting. Because it's all based upon my interpretation of my experience of myself as an experiencing body-mind entity. And, and, and taking that experience that I have as a body-mind entity, as knowledge, is the wrong way to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's not knowledge. <laughs> there may be bits and pieces of knowledge, but it's all what? It's all a particular point of view. Yeah, conceptual. It's and it's yeah. it's only conceptual and, and it may be true for you, but it's not true for everybody. Yeah. We're making a statement that's true for everybody. Yeah. Which means if it's true then it's knowledge, just like you know, fire is hot and sugar is sweet. That's knowledge. Yeah. That's true for everybody. Gravity is the same for everybody. There's no exceptions. Yeah. And, and breathe so, in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe yeah. out. People, yeah, that's right. This is just facts. Universal. Universal. And this is a universal truth. Everybody, everything, not just every human being, but everything is existence consciousness, is full, complete, ever blissful consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I can't understand that. Why can't I understand that? Because my mind is not adequately prepared to understand that because I'm so conditioned to the opposite view. Yeah. I'm all my whole thinking patterns, my whole everything about me, my emotional patterns, all that are based upon the incorrect assumption that reality is a duality. And there are some Advaita teachers, James, who, who say, well, it's a paradox. It's both, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, let's say, duality, and uh, it's dual and non-dual at the same time. They're absolutely right, but they, have no, they're, they're, they are correct. It is and it isn't. It's duality if I look at it from this point of view, and it's what non-dual if I look at it from that point mm -hmm. of view. So now we've got, it's a, reality is a both and, not an either or. Hmm. Okay, now how do I explain that? Because that's a big problem, isn't it? How can something be a duality and a non-duality at the same time? Because my idea is what? Non-duality cancels duality. Yeah. Hmm? 
If things are non-dual, then they're not dual. If things are dual, then they're not non-dual. Now, what is the teaching that they have to uh, remove that question? What teaching do they have? Advaita, yeah. No, 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 no. That's just Advaita. Just means non-dual. Mm -hmm. So non-dual doesn't remove that problem. What does? Yeah, you don't know because none of them know because, <laughs> huh? Because Vedanta is the only spiritual teaching that has the answer to this. We call it Satya Mitya. Okay? This is a very... This, and th if you understand this, then it will set you free. Oh. Huh? I'm hanging you, on your lips. It, it's just, if you understand this, it will set you free. Uh, in fact, it's, it is the essence of freedom or moksha. This, now this Satya Mitya comes from a statement made, a Vedanta statement, made in the 8th century that is based upon the Upanishad texts. All of our, this idea, uh, Satya and Mitya, is based upon the fundamental source texts of Vedanta, which come from the Vedic age or thousands of years ago, thousands of years before Christ. And that statement is this, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya Jivo Brahmeva na paraha. Okay. Now, what does that mean? I, wa I wanted to tell you that because I want you to understand that this is not James. Okay. This is, th I didn't invent this statement. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to explain this statement to you and hopefully in such a way that it will set you free. Now, what is that statement? How, in other words, the problem is, how do we resolve this, the idea that reality is a duality and reality is not dual? That non-duality and duality are not opposites? They're the same coin. The, the, that's right. We're, we're, because reality is non-dual, then if, re, if, if non-duality exists, then how do we explain, I mean, if duality exists, then how do we explain it if reality is non-dual? How, how do you make that explanation? Because that doesn't make sense, does it? Hmm? See, so we've got to get, you can't say that reality, that, that duality doesn't exist, can you? It looks that way. Yeah, because, because why? Because you experience duality. Yeah. So you, and, and the, the, the Neo people, the Neo Advaita people, they try to tell you that it doesn't exist. This is how they get around this problem. But they don't get around the problem by saying it doesn't exist. Tony Parsons and these people. All there is is this. All there is is this. They don't get, get you what, a way, they cannot explain to you why then that you're experiencing duality. If all there is is this, then I shouldn't be experiencing duality, should I? So how is it that I'm experiencing duality, but you're telling me that the reality is non-dual? See, we come back to this yeah. basic issue. Huh? Tell us, James. Brahma satyam jagan mitya jivo brahmeva na paraha. Hmm? Brahma satyam means what? Consciousness or existence or being, what you call being. Mm -hmm. right? Well, being is a good word, fine. Sat is the word sat. Brahma Satyam, okay, being means Sat, what is, reality. Mm -hmm. Reality is what is, isness or reality or truth or God or consciousness, or, these are all synonyms. Brahman is Brahma, what? Is limitless. Okay? Mm -hmm. Your being, you, who you are, is limitless. That means you're free. You have no limits. No bound. No boundaries. No duality. No divisions. No limits. It doesn't mean big. Limitless doesn't mean big. We don't, all over the place? It doesn't mean all over the no. place. No. no. What does it mean? <laughs> it means you are not modified or changed by what happens to you. 
because non-duality doesn't it means there's no time and space are not real. So you can't say that the self, you, are big, and you can't say it's small. In fact, our, uh, scripture says it's bigger than the biggest and smaller than the smallest, which means that it it's it neutralizes the idea that it's spatial. So you're not big means what? You, 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 that, you, that you're, I'm sorry, that you're satyam means what? You are limitless means that you're, you don't change when things, when your experience changes. That's a good one. You don't change when your experience changes. When things happen, you don't change. What? I think that everything that happened changes me. Hmm? I'm an experience junkie. I'm an experience <laughs> junkie. Yeah. My whole identity is based upon what happens to me. Yeah. And we're saying, no. And how am I going to show you that? How am I going to show you? Because we, we, we're saying this is a fact. Mm -hmm. So if it's a fact, then we have to be able to point out this fact to you. I, I, okay, we have, all of our teachings prove this fact. I, I'll ju I can just give you a, a one or two or a few. Mm -hmm. For example, it's your experience that you uh, observe your thoughts. Yeah. You know what you're thinking. They're yeah. just then. Yeah. Huh? You, you looked and you yeah. saw your thought, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Which means what? Your thought is an object known to you. Yeah. Right? Now, if you take... So, I am watching my thoughts. When that thought occurred, and I produced that thought in you mm -hmm. by asking you that question, I caused that thought to happen. Okay? Now... When that thought appeared, did you come into existence? Were you born? Did you, were you suddenly created at the, at the moment that thought came? No. No. That's, you know, you weren't. You were there prior to the no. thought, weren't no. you? Yeah. Okay. When the thought was there, were you present? Yeah. Yes, you were. And when the thought disappeared, did you disappear with the thought? No. 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 In other words, what? You're present and aware and conscious, and the thoughts are what? Appear and disappear in you. Yeah. Isn't that your experience? No. That's the experience of everybody. It's the same for everybody. Did that thought change you, your awareness, your consciousness, your existence? Did you become a different person, a different being when the thought appeared and when the thought disappeared? No. 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 That means what? What you experienced didn't affect you at all. Yeah. That's what limitless means. Doesn't matter if it, it was a dirty thought, a thought, a good thought, a bad thought. It has nothing to do. No, huh? no. Doesn't change you. That's called satyam. That's called you. That's called the truth. That part, that mm -hmm. being, that existence. Yeah. And it is not changed or modified by experience. So Brahma Satya, Brahma means you, consciousness, satyam, yeah, that existence consciousness. Jagdan Mitya, that's the second part of the statement. Mm -hmm. Now, what's juggin? Juggin, our word, you know the word juggler? Mm -hmm. A juggler? Yeah. Huh? That means what? Something that's always in motion. Yeah. Huh? Well, what is it that's always in motion? Our word juggler comes from juggin. Mm -hmm. It's a Sanskrit term. What, what is it that's always in motion? My thoughts. Yeah. My mind. My yeah. experience. Yeah. My experience is constantly moving and changing, isn't it? Yeah. And that is mitya. Oh, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> that's not satya. That's not the truth. Mm -hmm. That's not what's real and ever-present. That's mitya. 
Well, what the hell is mitya? That mitya means apparent and dependent. And we, we all of our teach, uh, all the teachings basically prove the same equation. But we we'll get, I can give you an example. Um, look at a, a, a wave in an ocean. What's the truth? Of, of, of an ocean and waves. It's all water. It's all water. What's the wave? Satya. Apparently true. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's uh, you you're very very clever because actually most people would say well the truth is the ocean because the ocean's always present and then the waves come out mm -hmm. of the ocean. Huh? But what there's also a higher fact there, isn't there? Which is what? The wave and the truth, the wave and the ocean are both H2O. Yeah. They're both water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but the wave, does the wave, is the wave free of the ocean? No. No. But the ocean's free of the wave, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. For the water of the ocean, it's no problem that there are waves all around. That's right. Yeah. Now, if you're this body-mind entity that y you think you are, is that a wave or is that the ocean? Well, I could be clever again and say it's both. You could be. <laughs> but in terms of this little teaching, yeah. huh? Okay, so, yeah. Okay. That that in other words, this person that you think you mm -hmm. are, this James, mm -hmm. is just a wave. Is just a wave yeah. in what? In existence. Yeah. I just come out of existence, and what? And when my life is over, I go back into existence. Yeah. In fact, I don't didn't really leave existence because I'm existent when I'm a wave. Yeah. Huh? And 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 when I what? When I cease to exist as a wave, I what? I exist as the ocean. Yeah. So you're just the ocean pretending to be a wave. That's it. Yeah. And the wave what is dependent and the ocean is independent yeah. or free. Yeah. Now, what about your experience? My experience is that what is independent always? My consciousness, yeah. me. And what's dependent? My thoughts and my experience. Now, if that is firm knowledge, you will never confuse yourself with what? Your body and mind. Yeah. Right? If, if that knowledge is firm, what? You're free. You're immortal. You don't, you don't, all of these problems that come from in life of living and dying and getting and keeping and all that stuff, all those things disappear. Why? Because they only apply to the wave. They don't apply to me to the ocean. Yeah. I am it, what is existent. I am what is always present. Yeah. Now it's hard. Huh? It, why is that hard to get? It's not hard to get. You got it, right? Yeah, when I'm sitting here with you, it's yeah, all very yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easy, yeah. huh? It's pretty yeah. straightforward yeah. when you hear the teaching. Yeah. But when, but when you pack up and you're on your way, and you and your girlfriend calls you up, or your boss fires you, or yeah. whatever it is, yeah. huh? Then are you happy? Are you the <laughs> are you the ocean? Huh? I'm back into the drama. Yeah, yeah. you're back into the drama. Yeah. Well, what for? Why? Well, some woman I talked to once said this hypnotic field of the person is so strong outside, let's okay. say, that you have to, yeah, you have to stand firm in this position of being the ocean. Absolutely. Well, that's right. We call it taking a stand in awareness. Yeah. You have to, you have to be firm in it. Because you get pulled back into this. Now, if it's, if it's hard and fast knowledge, you don't have to take a stand. Because it's just a fact. Yeah. So when you hear that your girlfriend left you, you say, "So what? I'm the I'm the ocean." 
and there's lots of waves in the ocean, and uh, maybe there'll be another girlfriend wave, and maybe there won't, but so what? I'm the ocean. I'm already, I'm all, yeah. always okay. So how come I So if if you if you if the knowledge is not firm then what what's the problem? Well, my mind is not capable of what, retaining that knowledge. Now, which means what? I've got some work to do on my mind. This is again what the neos don't tell you. Yeah. Do your homework. Do your homework. But they don't tell you what your homework is or how to do it. No. They say, do your homework. Well, yeah, do your homework, but what is the homework? Well, you get, you get a little a phrase called, like, uh, all, all, uh, all thoughts are not true. Yeah, well, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Yeah. Huh? No, the homework, that's true. It's true that the all thoughts are not true. But what is true? What is the truth? Okay, all thoughts are not true. Then, oh, then tell me what the truth is. Well, the truth is what? Me. I'm the truth. Well, if, if I'm the truth, then it doesn't matter whether the thoughts are true or not, does it? Then, then the issue is, is not about all thoughts are not true. It's very clear to me that all thoughts are not true. In fact, when we did this little analysis here of our experience, we saw what? The thoughts are not true because they're not present all the time. They're impermanent. Yeah. But this consciousness existence yeah. is always present. It's yeah. always true. It's permanent. Yeah. And its nature is limitlessness. Its nature is existence. It's free. It's ever blissful. It's always present. So all of the, everything that I want, I already have. I already am. Have is a bad word. Mm -hmm. I, whatever I want, I already have. This is what people ask me. What do you want? I say, I want what I have. <laughs> this look at me. Are you kid? Are you are you mad? Well, it means I don't want anything because I, I already have what I want. I am what I want. Yeah. Now this tendency to always want, you know, this desire. How am I going to get rid of this desire? Because it's this desire for objects that's causing me to forget who I am. As you, as you put it, was what, an irresistible attraction to the object yeah. or something. Yeah, the, the hypnotic field of the person. The hypnotic field of the person, right. Which, Unless it's like Donald Trump or somebody like that. That person doesn't hypnotize me. <laughs> <laughs> That person turns me off. Yeah. I want to run as far as I can for that person. Yeah. But huh? Yeah. That attraction to an object. Yeah. Right. Could I blame uh, all the commercials on TV for that? Yeah, you can. But does it help me? It does. No, it doesn't <laughs> help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can blame mom and pop, the federal government, religion, mm -hmm. the TV. You you, you know, because the whole world, right? tells you that there's something wrong with you. And you have to get something. And to that you need you. to get something to complete you. Yeah. That's get it. that new Rolex, get that car. Yeah, get that trophy wife, yeah. get that six pack abs, whatever yeah. it is, huh? I gotta have you gotta have that and then you're okay. Then you're complete. Yeah. Then the search stops. Yeah, you're okay for five minutes. Yeah. But five minutes of happiness is not good enough for me. No. I want to be happy all the time. James, can I tell you some 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 uh, dogmas from the Advaita world, which I'm very curious about your vision on it. Sure. Uh, for example, um, this world is an illusion. They tell me. Uh huh. And what I just heard from you uh, gives me a sense of that also. That you say uh, this world is not real, full of objects. Yeah. So it's all temporary. It's temporary. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we don't like the word illusion, although that's okay. Uh, it, illusion is something you experience, but it isn't real. Is the world real? That's my question. No, the world is not real. Satya, what it, Brahma, Satyam, Jag, and Mitya. Mm -hmm. Now, real, the, the, Mitya is an interesting category because it's neither real nor is it not real. The ontological category is different. We mm -hmm. think, well, is the world real or not? No, the world is mitya. 
Now, what does real mean? Real means always present mm -hmm. and never changing. Yeah. Huh? So that's the definition of real. What's always present and doesn't change. Yeah. Okay, so that's real. Now, the world is what? Pres sometimes present, but it's always changing. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Because the world is nothing but your thoughts about the world. The world is, is just your experience of the world. And your experience is only subjective. If there was any objective world, then everybody would see the same thing yeah. here. Yeah. Huh? For the little ants, the world is completely different. Completely different. A tree is yeah. a conscious being, but it looks different to the tree. Yeah. And then from one person to another, depending yeah. on their condition, it's totally... Yeah. It's so there's not one, one world. One objective world, would you say? Yeah, there, yeah. there's no, uh, the world is non-objective. Well, there is an objective world. In other words, we call that Ishwara. That is, if your senses are operating properly, then, you, and I put my hand here, you have no choice but to see a hand. <laughs> yeah. huh? And your knowledge will be this is hand knowledge. So that we call Vyavaharika Satyam. That means the part of reality that's empirical. Because if that uh, if that's if that world's a, totally an illusion, then we can't count on anything here. We can't count on science. When your ears go bad, you can't go to a guy to fix your ears because they're totally personal. It's totally subjective. He huh? But the fact is, your eyes and ears and your senses are all principles that are operating here, they're knowledge that's created by Ishwar or God. And so there's a certain objectivity there, a practical objectivity there. It's not real in the sense that what? It changes all the time, but the changes are predictable. Hmm. Hmm? There's, that's, why, that's why we can have sciences, because the changes are predictable. So it, Satyam means it seemingly real appears to be real. appears to be real yeah that's that's yeah. the word huh? now we're you know as a body mind as a person that we think we are called that's called a jiva or a reflection a reflection of awareness there's pure original consciousness existence and then that reflected in the mind is called a jiva that jiva is apparently real it's not actually real. Now, my problem is I take it to be an actual reality. I don't take it to be apparent reality. I think my life is real. And when my life is actually what? A dream. It's like watching a movie. It exists. We can't say it doesn't exist because we experience it. You can't experience something that doesn't exist. No. Huh? No. It's obvious. Now, the Neos have no idea about this. They, they say these words, but they have no teaching. You see how carefully I, I unfolded that? So it's perfectly understandable to you. Yeah. Now, what Vedanta does is Vedanta has all of, we call these prakriyas, these teachings that I've been uh, sharing with you or working on you, actually working them on you. And when you, you're following them carefully, yeah. and you, uh, then it's, you understand it. It's clear. Yeah. Hmm? So... All of these practices, all these teachings, just what do they do? They give you different windows, looking at everything from a different angle on the same truth over and over and over again. And if you expose your mind to this teaching consistently, all of your notions of duality will disappear. But you've got to do the work. In other words, you have to apply the knowledge and that knowledge needs to be taught to you. You need to learn how to think this way. See, I'm just thinking differently. Yeah. I'm thinking from the platform of non-duality. I'm not thinking from the platform of duality. The modern Advaita teachings are all thinking from the platform of duality. They're talking about non-duality, but all of their thoughts and their teaching comes from duality. So they imagine that they're non-dual, but they're actually dualists. Yeah. Because they don't have a teaching. Yeah. They're talking about 
the topic. But not from. That's right. Yeah. And they're not, and their thinking or their teachings are not what coming from it. Yeah. And that applies to all Advaita teachers. You, you uh, see, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not one you say, well, he. Well, I, I don't know, except oh. in our tradition. Uh, you'll hear bits and pieces, yeah. and you can benefit from them. We're not saying you can't benefit mm -hmm. from them, but you won't get the whole teaching. Luckily, we have you and your books. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, one thing I wanted to get back to was, was this, why I don't understand and what you can do. Because this is another huge problem with the, with the Advaita people. And, and listen, they're not bad people. No, they don't mean wrong. They not, they're, most of them are well-meaning. There's, no. a, there's a few rascals and scoundrels there who are just chasing power and pleasure and wealth. You got the Andrew Cohens and those kind of people. Mm -hmm. Even they're not bad people. They're just misguided or misunderstood. Yeah. You know, they have psychological problems that cause them to use the spiritual world for psychological reasons rather than for, for the truth. But... So they're not bad people, but they're, they don't have a complete teaching. And it's all experiential. It's based upon their own experience. And they're saying, well, because I experience non-duality, you can experience non-duality. Well, even if you can experience non-duality, you'll be back to duality when the experience ends. Yeah. So everybody knows that. Yeah. Now, what's, what they don't tell you is this. And the reason they don't tell you this is because they don't have a teaching, and that is what you can do. They, tell, they don't tell you, they, they tell you can't do anything because you're already free. Yeah, you're already it. You're already it, and you're not a doer. Yeah. That, okay, on yeah. top of that, yeah. Yeah. you're already it, and you're not a doer, both yeah. of which are true, but what, that's totally an unhelpful teaching. Is this? No, it's still running. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's a totally unhelpful teaching. But let me put it in plus one. They're a totally unhelpful teachings. Why? Because I actually think I'm a doer, and my whole thought system is based around the fact that I'm a doer. Yeah. Me the doer, me the hearer, me the experience. And yeah, and that yeah. that doer is not going to just disappear. Nothing what? in nature just suddenly poofs and disappears, <laughs> huh? That doer, enjoyer entity, yeah. has been there. Forever. Yeah. It's built up an accretion of thoughts and experience, we call it karma, that, that just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. They're saying, well, you're not that, you're this, and there's nothing you can do about it. Just wait for grace. Yeah. Well, excuse me? <laughs> there, huh? That's absolutely incorrect. That's why people keep satsang happening mm -hmm. because they, they don't give them a, 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 a sadhana, what we call a sadhana or spiritual work to do. To what? To prepare their mind to understand this. And once they understand it, to keep their mind clear until the knowledge is firm. Yeah. This can be understood. That's what. Uh, yeah. 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 The understanding is not a problem. You've got the understanding. Mm -hmm. you're, you're very clear about it. I could tell by you're following it and then you mm -hmm. feed back and you accept it. It's, it's just, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the work I, got, I have to do? Okay, that's the point. They don't tell you what the work is. Well, the work is karma yoga and jnana yoga. Or there's three actually. Karma yoga, vipassana yoga, I mean up, uh, upasana yoga, mm -hmm. not vipassana. Karma yoga, upasana yoga, and... Uh, Yana yoga. Well, we'll call it yana and upasana. So we could just reduce it to two. Karma yoga and yana yoga. Now, what is that? Should I go Come meditate? Huh? <laughs> Should I go meditate? No. No. You, that, you, that's, part of, that's part of karma yoga. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, no, you shouldn't go meditate. You should, huh? Until, you un until you're practicing karma yoga. Why? Why shouldn't you meditate? Because unless you practice, because meditation is the same problem, isn't it? You get quiet, it's just like an epiphany. You get peaceful and you get quiet. As soon as you stop meditating and go back to your life, what happens? Yeah, yeah right? your mind gets disturbed again, yeah. and then you have to run back and start meditating yeah. again, don't you? Yeah. 
So you got the same problem with meditation you had in the world, chasing the women, chasing yeah. the money, chasing the power. As soon as what the thing changes, you got to go back and get it again or get another object. Yeah. So meditation doesn't work until unless you have karma yoga. Now what is karma yoga? Karma yoga burns up your karma. Well, how do I burn up my karma? Huh? Everybody says, well, you've got to get rid of your karma. And, and, and of course, the Neo teaching is that you got to stop your mind. Stop thinking. Well, yeah. Yes and no. First of all, you can't stop thinking. You can reduce your thinking to some degree and you can change the quality and texture of your thoughts. But they don't tell you how to do this at all. They just tell you it's an act of will or something or go ahead and do it. But you can't do it. You need karma yoga. This is the most glaring and biggest problem of this neo teachings, these Advaita teachings, Ad Advaita teachings, as they call it. Huh? You're not so fond of. <laughs> well, no, I'm not. I mean, I went through it. See, yeah. It's not that I'm against it. No. I went through it. I think I was a lucky one who got through it. Uh, and 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 it didn't stop. And and found Vedanta. Yeah. You know, when you get over it, then then you know, Vedanta will come to you if you have good karma. If you're not, then you're just then you're really lost, because you know you've tried the world and then the then the 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 neo world didn't work. So then you get depressed and you go back and you try to make the world work, or you just you know you just in despair. You get over that dark night of the soul area. No, the whole problem with them is the is the it, with this this neo teaching is they don't have karma yoga. Hmm. First, I explained to you they don't have a teaching, yeah. a proper teaching. That's called yana yoga, but you can't understand yana yoga unless you got karma yoga, and nobody teaches karma yoga. And even the people that teach karma yoga in the Indian spiritual world, ninety nine percent of them teach it wrong. Hmm. Give they us, just, huh? Give us the right way, James. Well, the wrong way is is. You see, you've you got to do selfless service. So you come and we're in my ashram and I'll put you to work and you'll burn up your karma oh, there. Yeah. yeah. That's huh? worship. Huh? Work is your, your work is your worship. worship yeah. huh? And that, that's not karma yoga. That could be karma yoga, but it isn't. Not the way it's sold. You just think, well, if I mechanically do all these things and give all my effort and time and money to the guru, to the church, or, you know, how did the Catholic Church get so big? Huh? Yeah. And how do all these institutions get so big? They get you to go and give your money and your effort and your time, and they tell you that's good for you spiritually. Yeah, it's not good for you spiritually. You haven't you you haven't gained anything. All you've got is what you just got yourself stuck in another samsaric activity. Yeah, and you're thinking it's a very spiritual thing, and so huh? You don't get free from doing this. Hmm. Karma yoga sets you free from what? your misconceptions and your negative states of mind. Now, how does it do that? That's the point. Mm -hmm. Karma yoga is an attitude that you take with respect to action and its results. What does that mean? Karma, huh? What you... Uh, I mean, uh, what's what's the thing called? What you reap is what you sow. No. What you sow is what, what you, you reap. reap. That's yeah. No, everybody knows that. That's not karma no? yoga. No, that's not karma yoga. That's you know what you sow is what you you get back what you put out. Yeah. But we don't care about what we put out or what we get back because we're not looking for good karma. When we practice karma yoga, we're not looking for good karma and we're not trying to get rid of bad karma. What are we doing? We're purifying our minds. We're, huh? we're, we're, why do we want a pure mind? So we can understand these teachings. Mm. And so once we understand it, the, what, the knowledge sticks. Yeah. And that we're no longer confused and, and identify ourselves with objects that are appearing in us. And we remain free. So karma yoga is not about making good karma. It's making room. Yeah, it's, it's, what, it's, it's, because there's no bad result from karma yoga. 
if you do karma, there's good results and bad results. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're skillful, you'll get maybe more good results than bad results. If you're not so skillful, you'll get more bad results than good results, and you'll be a depressed person or an angry person. Hmm. You know, happy people are people who basically get more good results than bad results. Uh, you know, because they're skillful in action, but karma yoga is not skill in action. Kar karma yoga is what removing the tendencies uh, that are f causing you to chase objects. Now those tendencies are called vasanas. This is a technical discussion based upon that. I ha I, uh, though, whenever you do an action, it, leaves, it causes a result. It causes an immediate result. Like if I insult you, say you're a jerk and you punch me in the nose, well, that's an immediate result. Yeah. Huh? If it feels good that when you punch me in the nose, then the next time you, next time somebody insults you, you will punch them in the nose. Yeah. You had another option. You could not punch them in the nose, or you could feel bad punching them in the nose, so you wouldn't do it. But but no, you t you when they feel bad, you punch them. In. Why did you punch them in the nose the second time? Yeah, because it felt good. Yeah, because you got a vasana to do it. You have a tendency to yeah, do it, yeah. and the next time you punch it, then what? Then you're you're going to punch the person when every time you're going to respond in that particular way. So this your unconscious mind is sending you out whenever you chase an object or avoid an object, huh? You you condition your mind. It's your conditioning. You condition your mind to behave in a certain way, so that all your thoughts run toward particular objects that you think are gonna. Now karma yoga huh, removes those tendencies to think that way. From the subconscious. Yeah, you're right. It purifies your subconscious mind. Yeah. It obviously will change your your life too. So your conscious mind is going to be changed, obviously. But karma, karma yoga, you introduce a particular kind of thought into your mind that isn't there mm -hmm. in normal situations. You have karma yoga. You have to like in, take a, a or make a cognitive shift. <clears throat> now, what when you want something or you don't want something? <coughs> what's behind that? Fear or desire, greed, yeah. or anger. And what? And an expectation that I should have that thing and that if I get that thing, it will make me happy. Now, Karma Yoga says this. Fair enough. You can act and you can go for a thing, for whatever it is, but you don't have any right to get it. Now, everybody basically knows that, don't they? Because if you, if it was your right to have what you want, to get the results of you, and you only do actions because you want the results, mm -hmm. and you think those results will complete you. The problem is that what? That I am not the one that produces the results, am I? Because if you produce the results, then you'd have everything you want. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't have everything I want. That's why I'm upset and unhappy and miserable. Yeah. And that's why I'm seeking things, spiritual things or whatever, or worldly things. It doesn't matter. So then what is it or who is it or what is it that's producing the results? My karma. Um, yes, but who's producing my karma? <laughs> Where's my karma coming from? Because my karma, huh? Because my karma is not up to me either, is it? No. Or apparently not up to me. It actually is to some degree. But you never know what's going to happen from one moment to the next. Yeah. This is why everybody's like constantly on their 
cell phones and stuff and on the day and the internet trying checking to the news. checking the news and figuring out and talking to their friends and trying to figure out what's happening all the time yeah. everybody's nervous and, and anxious and concerned yeah. about what's going to happen why because they don't know what's going to happen yeah. it's trying to reassure yourself that everything's going to be that fine. everything's going to be is fine. the world safe but yeah is the world but but the world is never safe no and yet results keep coming so where are the results coming from? From the field, from the world. We call it the field of existence. Mm -hmm. When I make an offering, and that's when I do an action into the world, mm -hmm. we call that an offering. So karma yoga is like a religious thing. It's not religious like religion. Mm -hmm. It's like a contribution or making an offering. When I make an offering to the world of my actions, then what? That, that result of that action is out of my hands now. If the result of my actions is out of my hands, then is any of the subsequent anxiety and worry for the results a legitimate? Huh? No. 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 <laughs> if, if I have control over the results, then yeah, worry, you know, get yourself all fear, worry, desire, do all the things you want, you know, manipulate and try to change and make everything change and to make it work. But hey, it's not up to me. Yeah. Well, who's it up to? The field of existence. Okay, God. We're not afraid of the word God because we know who God is. Mm -hmm. You know, spiritual people hate the word God. It's, it's got too much religious connotations about it. So we just call it the field of existence. So, or Ishwara, we have a technical term, Ishwara. We have several words for it, but basically. It means what? The field, my environment, is what's determining results. So, understanding that, what do I do? I surrender the results of my actions to the field or to God. I let go and let God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. That's right. It's all the the, the Islam's guys got it right. That's right. Inshallah. Oh, it's a, who, who, you know, it's not up to me. Now, what's that going to do to my mind? It makes it more humble. Yeah, yeah. and clear yeah. and still and steady. Why? Because the vasana, the worry, the subconscious worry goes out when I surrender the result. Yeah. So then what? Every action that I do in the world becomes a purification of my mind. I don't go and meditate to purify my mind. I don't go to church to purify my mind. I don't read holy books. To, well, you can, and that's helpful in the second stage. But what? If my life is not a worship, and if my life is not my spiritual practice, then what the hell good is it? Because my life, the way I'm living my life is what? Is totally disturbing my mind. Mm -hmm. And no wonder I'm not getting anywhere spiritually. So maybe that, that, that's a very interesting point. Maybe if I look at myself and some friends who are actively looking into this, we think that it's separate from life. We think that we go on and chase all the women <laughs> yeah, and, and, and talk dirty to, to, the, to the neighbor. And then, yeah. and then in the weekends we go to satsang. And ah. uh, <laughs> relief. Yeah. See the dualist, see the dualistic yeah. notion. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. That's right. Your 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 spirit. Your life is your spiritual work. The problem is my attitude toward life is the wrong attitude. That's why I said karma yoga is an attitude with respect to action and its results. Yeah. It's not a particular action or a particular result. But then the Advaita teacher tell me, well, forget about it. You're not the doer. Yeah. So you can't change anything you do. That's right. And so what is what is the basic what is their basic uh, what is the basic uh, uh, subjective result that I get from that? I, 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 
I, you, you get you get resigned. Yeah, you, you get distance. You from get life. negative, and you get yeah. distance from life. Yeah. Huh? You don't participate in life. You try to avoid life, and what? And you don't get any happier because you're not dealing with your damn karma, <laughs> yeah. huh? You're putting off your karma. Yeah. You're avoiding it. You're running away yeah. or escaping. The word you used from the very beginning was escape. Yeah. You're escaping from life. You're not engaging life. Now, karma yeah. yoga says you have to engage it, but you have to engage it with this attitude that the results of the action are not up to you. And then the next part, which is even more difficult to karma yoga, and this is why people don't like it, is what? You have to take the result in, with what? As prasad. We have a particular technique, so that means as a gift. Even if it's... Even if it's a, a result I don't want. Yeah. So what? Whatever happens is yeah, and so and you welcome bad results, because they teach you, huh? They show you where you're what your idea is in conflict with the nature of life or reality. Yeah. You you when you get a bad result, you don't think it's your problem. You think it's the world's problem. Yeah. You say, well, you know, the government this and the church that and my wife this and the job, my boss that, and you blame the world for it. Yeah. The reason you're getting a bad result is because, well, you got a bad idea about your relationship to life. You're not following Dharma. We call it Dharma. Dharma is just the rules of life. The physical rules, the psychological rules, and the moral rules that are operating in, in, in the apparent reality. In the mitya aspect of reality, and we're talking now about a person who's living in the mitya, in the dream, in the dream world, in this ordinary everyday dream world. Mm -hmm. I'm just what so concerned about myself that I what don't understand what the rules are here, and I'm not playing by the rules. And when I get whacked, huh? When something bad happens, huh? I just blame the world. I don't think it's my fault at all. So we're happy to get bad karma. Happy. Happy, yeah. Please give me more bad karma. Quack me. I need to understand something. Yeah. I'm ignorant here. Yeah. I don't understand, God, what, what you want. Because this isn't about me getting what I want. I will get what I want if I do what I, is expected of me here. You don't, nobody came here on their own. No. Nobody created their own body or mind. No. Nobody created the world around here. There's not one damn thing that me as a per, uh, that I as a person can claim that I created, or that I own. Not one thing. Every single thing that I have is given to me. My brain, my intelligence. My life, the air, the, air, the water, the every, all the objects, everything is given to me. And what? And so I don't, that means what? Something or somebody else put me here in this situation. And that what expects, me, there's an expectation what, from the world that I behave in a certain way. That I make a contribution to the world. Yeah. When you do that, your mind gets so peaceful and you get so happy. And then these teachings go right in. So it's in tune with life. You're in, yeah. yeah. You, you're right. You remove the conflict yeah. of life. You become in tune. Now then, the next stage, now I can meditate. Because my life is taking care of my agitations. And my mind becomes meditative naturally. Yeah. And then the next stage is what? Then I'm able to what? Hear these teachings of Vedanta and apply those teachings to my mind. But the Jnana Yoga, the knowledge thing, doesn't work without the Karma Yoga. I need the Karma Yoga. And the modern teachings don't have it. They don't teach it. Huh? They don't know it. They don't understand the value of it. Huh? And, and this is why people just don't get enlightened through this modern uh, Advaita <laughs> Advaita world. No. Why they just keep hopping. Yeah. And it and it there's it's not bad in the sense that at least they're trying. 
and at least they're hearing the ideas. And they're, you know, it's good that they want freedom and all of that, but it's just a very limited and inadequate and incomplete uh, path to uh, freedom. Yeah. We, we call Vedanta a pathless path. We use, we use those two words together. That's against another strange thing. Well, how can be pathless and be a path? Or how can, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's pathless in that the distance between you and yourself is, is zero. Mm -hmm. So there's no path. There's nothing you can do. On the other hand, it's a path because there's something you can do to understand that. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a matter of escaping the world or, or not doing so that was the day I was, you know, during when you've heard of Ramesh Balsakar. At one time he was very famous. Now I don't know, people, I never hear people talk much about it, but most everybody's been through Ramesh. But those same teachings are still out there, that you're not the doer. But, but when, I lived, when I was in India, when he was, fam when he was famous, people all came to Chiruvannamalai after they'd been to Bombay. And I talked to, I don't know, hundreds of them over the years. And I would always ask them, well, what are you doing? Well, what's your, what's your sadhana? Mm -hmm. What practice? What am I doing? I said, well, why not? Because I'm not a doer. Well, excuse me, the doer is not doing. Not doing is an action. What, what are you result are you going to get from not doing? You're not going to get anything that result but nothing. You'll get nothing because you're not doing. And huh? But they, oh, huh? No, you have to, the doer has to do. For what? For this purpose. I don't know, and, and Ramesh's teaching was just, you know, it was a, a really poor man's karma yoga. He was basically saying, life's tough, tough, suck it up, you're not the doer, quit complaining and whining. Okay, that's fine. But, huh, there was no, huh, understanding of, of what karma yoga is supposed to do for you spiritually, which is to purify your mind. Yeah. For for the purpose of gaining freedom, for understanding these teachings, and so you have these people teaching Brahma Satyam, you know, they're telling you the world's not real and you're not your mind and your consciousness. But what? No way to implement that teaching because yeah. there's no karma yoga and the jnana yoga is incomplete. Yeah. One one final thing I want to ask you, James, in in this uh, uh, world of non-duality. Uh, a favorite subject everybody wants to talk about is free will. Did I come here to talk with you out of free will uh -huh. or did it just happen? Uh, yes and no is the answer. Yes, there's free will and no, there's not free will. Both are true. From the individual's point of view, there's definitely free will. If, huh? Every time you do something, you're exercising free will. And if there's no free will, we won't even have a scripture or a teaching, will we? There's no free will for, there's no scripture for animals, is there? No. There's no teaching for, why? Because they don't have free will. If the, if, if the, you know, if the monkeys and the dogs and the cats had free will, then there'd be a scripture for them because then they could think and then they'd have problems, they'd have karma and all that sort of thing and then you'd have to give them advice yeah. and tell them what to do. So, huh? so there's definitely free will for the jiva when you look at it from that point of view. But when you look at it from Ishwara's point of view, there's no free will. Ishwara means the total field. Yeah. Everything here is programmed from that point of view. So, yes, looking at it from this point of view, no, looking at it from that point of view. Both true. Yeah. Now, that does, now what they, both are true. But that doesn't mean that because it's true on that level, it, 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 you, you shouldn't do anything here. Yeah. This is a problem what people want to do. They want to escape. They say, well, it's all programmed. It's only going to happen when it happens. So I'm not going to do anything and it'll happen. Well, it's not going to happen. When, it's not going to happen because you have to do something here. If you don't pay your taxes and they, and they, they come to you and you go to the, the judge and the, you say, but judge, I didn't pay my taxes. You can't, you can't put me in jail for not paying my taxes. You can, huh? 
I didn't do anything. Yeah. I'm free. I didn't do anything. Yeah. If I do something, put me in jail. No, no, no. It's not like that. No. You you have to act here. You have no choice about action here. Yeah. The thing you, you huh? You you have to act. Why do you have to act here? Because consciousness, awareness, is shining on your body and mind. This material aspect of yourself, and it forces actions. You are active from womb to tomb. Yeah. So there's no there's no choice about that. But am I am I living or am I being lived? You're well. You're living from the Jiva's point of view, but you're being lived yeah. from a yeah. Ishwar or God's yeah. point of view. But then on some Advaita sites, I read everything happens according to the cosmic plan, and then give me yeah. gives me this this sense of relief. I think ah. So I never did anything wrong. No, that's right. If you can take that point of view, you're fine as a jiva, but that still doesn't set you free. Why not? Because <laughs> you're not the jiva. You're not the person. Mm -hmm. It'll give you relief. Yeah. And karma yoga gives you relief from the anxiety of being a person. But it, what? you still have problems. Yeah. Huh? You're still worried about money. You're still worried about love. Help. You're yeah. still worried about your health. You're whatever. I don't know. Everybody worries mm -hmm. about some damn thing. But people who know they are don't worry. They don't worry about one thing. I I haven't had, I I haven't had a worry for forty five years. Because I'm awareness. Yeah. I'm existence consciousness awareness. I, I this. I'm not a person. I act like a person. Yeah. I pretend like I'm a person. I behave like a person. So, you know. But you know better. But I know better. I know yeah. very well I'm not a person. Yeah. And that even that person isn't even a person. Because there's no worries. It's just a vehicle for me to express my. Yeah. To express. And when that goes, I don't go. When my body goes, I don't go. Because I was here when my body appeared. Yeah. My body appeared in front of me. Yeah. Huh? And my body's going to disappear from in front of me. Huh? It's like the old Indians uh, who said, I don't appear in a room. The room appears in me. Absolutely. That's all. They're just looking at it from what consciousness, from, yeah. your, from the point of view of their true self, you could call it. Yeah. So I never, never traveled anywhere. I never been. I never done anything. I've never traveled anywhere. There's nothing for me to gain. There's yeah. nothing for me to lose. Huh? That's real reassurance. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. You're not even reassured when you're then. Be, the reassurance is the first stage, but after that, you don't, you don't need. need you don't need any reassurance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One final thing, James. Yeah. They talk about the Advaita shuffle. Uh, you heard maybe the, the, the term once. Yeah. Is that what you call taking this one standpoint and saying, well, I'm not the doer, I'm yeah, not the feeder? Yeah, sure. It's shuffling uh, off your responsibility on Ishwar, huh? when you've got to take responsibility here. But a lot of Advaita teachers tell me that I'm nev I've never been responsible for anything. Yeah, and that, but who are they talking to? Are they the person. The person. Yeah. Yeah. The, the person is responsible for everything. The, what they mean is the self isn't yeah. responsible yeah. for anything. Yeah. But the self is also responsible, but it's not. It's not bothered yeah. by being responsible because it's not affected by anything. But what is responding then? What? what? Well, talking about responsible. What, what is the person responding to another person? No, the person is responding to the environment, whatever yeah. is around him. Yeah. Dharma means appropriate response. Yeah. That means I need to respond appropriately to whatever the situation demands of me. Yeah. Right. So you're definitely, as a person, you are responsible. You have to respond. Yeah. You're able to respond. You're able, you are able to respond. And, and whether you're able or not doesn't matter. You're responding anyway. Because <laughs> <Yeah, yeah, yeah. laughs> huh? it isn't up to you. Yeah. Now we're saying, what attitude should I have when I respond? Should I respond right, right, in, a, in a 
with an attitude that I have to extract value from the world? Or should I, yeah, exactly. Or should my response be, I have to contribute yeah. to the world? And when you take, when you change from an extractor to a contributor, suddenly your whole life takes off. Yeah. So, huh? The problems just disappear. Because, and you're, what, you're eager to do what is required. You, you, and you don't even think about it. You just know. Hey, it's just natural to respond in this way. So when something needs to be done, you do it. Yeah. Not without discrimination. If somebody comes up and asks you to murder, you know, kill their wife, well, that, then that's going to cause a problem. That's not dharma. So uh, that's not an appropriate response. <laughs> yeah. Appropriate response is to tell them, sorry, that breaks the rule. You want to kill your wife, you go ahead and kill your wife. That's up to you. But you're going to get the karma from that. But I'm not going to kill your wife because, you know, I'm, that's not an appropriate response because she's me. Yeah. Because right? behind all of this whole thing is this idea that this is a non-dual reality. So, you know, yes, I, I'm, I'm forced to criticize uh, Neo, the, the, the yeah. modern Advaita. You just have to. At the same time, uh, it's not uh, um, an unwarranted criticism, and it's the and the criticism is based upon the simple fact that reality is non-dual, yeah. and that 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 the, and that's why there's logic. Mm -hmm. And you did so in a loving way, and that's maybe yeah, yeah. a good way to end this interview. We haven't used the word love uh, already. Well, yeah, but but yeah. Could you say that I was for 40 years trying to get love from the world, from the world? Yeah, but when I understand who I am, I'm, I'm, I'm here to give the world yeah. love. That's something you bring to the party, not you get out of the party. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so simple. But you know, it's so difficult in our world because everybody, everybody tells you that, you, that you know, you're small and inadequate and incomplete. And you need to get what you want. Yeah. And so people just, you know, you can see the breakdown in the society, the destruction of the environment and the wars and the conflicts and all the problems that are there in the society. It's because people are trying to get and they're not trying to give. Yeah. You know, it's a simple thing. So anyway. Thank you for this gift. You Well... <laughs> Thank the Lord. Don't yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah. When people, some practical things, when people want to come and visit you this weekend in Amstelveen, uh, you give a lecture um, tonight. I don't know if it's online already, but this weekend, Saturday, Sunday. Yes, uh -huh. we're, we're, we're going to uh, take in a, there are quite a few people in, in, in uh, uh, Netherlands here who've been in, involved in Vedanta for a number of years. And we also give uh, and and meetings. so we're taking a little it's in English mm -hmm. uh, we've got on the website we have some uh, texts that are being translated into Dutch okay now uh, but um, it's um, your first book isn't uh, translated in Dutch it, it isn't but it isn't in, uh, there's some of parts of it have been translated I think it's yeah. a big job it's now coming out in German uh, this month but I don't think Dutch people read German probably Maybe maybe some of them yeah. do, but uh, the essence of enlightenment is is readable in English, and I think Dutch people speak English very yeah. well. Yeah. So we don't. I don't translate here. But this text that we're taking this weekend is a little more advanced text, because the people have gotten the basics. Yeah. Vedanta is a, a program. You have to start with the basics and work up, yeah. and you can't skip. The problem with the neos is they jump. They just take. They sit here and they want to jump you all, yeah. all the way to the end. Yeah. And there, there's nothing in between. But this is a, just a very logical, consistent uh, path. Yeah. And and you just go for step, 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 step. So no quick fix. No quick fixes. But do uh, I do I need to uh, resign from my job and no. get into this for five years? No, or? no, no. You no. You do your job as karma yoga. Yeah. That's what the you, mind says. You, yeah, you know, you don't. We don't. No way. 
if, 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 if you're a sannyasi, in other words, if you already have that kind of temperament and you don't need to, you don't worry about the world, then fair enough. You, you can, mm -hmm. uh, but no, absolutely, you know, you continue right where you are. We're, we're not saying escape the world, we're saying contribute to the world, right? And make that world your spiritual practice and then at the same time develop your what? Your knowledge, mm -hmm. your self knowledge, yeah. and and there's no uh, contradiction here. But of course, the idea is, you know, the world is a bad place, and it's so much trouble, and this and that, and I should go to India and get in a cave, and and you know, and go to yeah. Guru and be spiritual yeah. and wear orange clothes and dadi da, -di -da <laughs> chant mantras and be sweet and holy and all that stuff and not nonsense. It doesn't work. It just uh, it just causes more more conflict. Yeah. So the, the Bhagavad Gita is a good one for karma yoga. It explains it. I've already taught it here, and uh, so this this weekend we're going to do what's called Panchadasi, which is the first two chapters. It's a huge text, but I'm just taking the first two chapters because most of these people are ready for it. But it's, even a, a new person could probably pretty well understand it. Yeah, you give meetings in, in Europe uh, some more? You, next yes, uh, next I go to uh, Cologne. Germany? And, and then, yeah, then, uh, then, uh, then to uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm. We have a five-day seminar in Berlin. And then Bad Meinberg at a big yoga center there. And after that, uh, I think that's the end of it for this, this trip. Yeah. And then I'm back in the fall. So the, uh, the schedule's on the website. Yeah. And then we do in the States for the summer and then coming back. I'll probably uh, ha have a home in, in Europe. We're looking at a fellow friend bought a, uh, some land in Portugal. And so we'll probably have a little house there, there. And he wants to build a, he's got an old farm house that he wants to re make into a, a satsang meditation center. Yeah. That's good for people who are getting yeah, tired for, from Muji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Muji as a center. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Muji. Yeah, yeah, Muji as a center there. <laughs> yeah, Muji is a typical Neo. He's, yeah. a, he's a good guy. He's not He's yeah. not a bad guy. Uh, he, you know, but there's no, you know, no real teaching there. Yeah, but still you say that could but be it's an fine. entrance. No, it's good. Yeah. It's fine. It's good. Yeah. They're, they, you know, they're doing their kind of own, their own sort of you know, karma, you know, little karma yoga view. They're they're getting some kind of knowledge. They're not getting. Basically, those people are there for the sangha, not for the sat. Mm. The sat is the truth, and the and they they're attracted to the truth. But what they like is the warm, fuzzy, yeah. huggy feeling. Muji's a great personality. He can hug him. He, can hug him. <laughs> he looks good. He's got the brown skin. He's the dreadlocks. Up dreadlocks. He's avuncular. <laughs> He's like a good big uncle. He's warm and little chubby yeah. and fuzzy. And 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 they all talk love and they like the shakti and all. That, huh? So they're all happy there and fine. Fair enough. But you look like a, a lovable guy also. So. Oh yeah, I'm a big lovable yeah. lover boy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, James. you bet. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet and, you too. Uh, you know, if you, uh, what are you? Are you gonna put this on your website? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you want to send me a copy, it'd be great. I can put it on the website, okay. and, and I could link to yours. And Will do. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, you bet.